So today I want to talk about minimum control speed. Minimum control speed is a speed in a multi-engine aircraft that is designed to be the speed at which the rudder no longer has authority to overcome the yaw produced when the critical engine has been lost in a multi-engine aircraft. This can be indicated by a red radial line. It's a little bit misleading to have a single red radial line because VMC can occur at a variety of airspeeds and there's several factors that affect it. But let's say we're just flying along and like we have here, we have a perfectly normal multi-engine aircraft coming back from either a great vacation or the beach, something like that. And then all of a sudden we lose one of those engines. And in this scenario, we'll say we lost the left engine. Now we have what's called asymmetrical thrust. Initially we had symmetrical thrust, each engine was producing the same amount of thrust, but now it's asymmetrical. Or one engine is trying to pull the aircraft around the center of gravity. Well, the problem with that is, is we need a way to counteract that or we're going to lose control of the aircraft. And the only real uh, way that we can do that is with the rudder. So if you think about the thrust vector, the thrust that that operative engine is producing, if you think about it, along with the distance from that thrust vector to the center of gravity, that creates a force that we can call the engine forces. That thrust in arm will be offset by the same forces on the rudder, whatever the rudder's force is producing and the distance from the rudder to the center of gravity. When we talk about rudder forces, we're really talking about the airflow across the rudder and the rudder's deflection turning the aircraft against that asymmetrical thrust. And if we think about it, as airspeed increases, that rudder is going to be more effective. So as the aircraft decelerates, as it starts to slow down, it gets to a point to where the rudder no longer can offset that asymmetrical thrust, and that is minimum control speed. That's the point at which you lose directional control uh, of the aircraft because the rudder no longer has enough air flowing over it to counteract the thrust from that operative engine. And this gives us an example of that. So if we're at VMC, but we're VMC, let's say, plus 20, then the rudder is going to have more authority. There's going to be more airflow flowing across the rudder, which is going to result in a, uh, just a better control of the aircraft. You're going to be at a safer speed. And as it decelerates, now it takes more rudder to counteract for the amount of thrust the engine's producing. And when you reach VMC, you're going to be at a full-scale deflection. There will be no more effectiveness of the rudder and you're going to lose control of the aircraft. Let's look at a graphical explanation of VMC. and This is one of my favorite ways to look at it because it really clearly shows you the importance of VMC and the loss of control of it, of the aircraft. So if the engine forces are producing a thousand foot-pounds of force, which is the red line that you see there on the graph, and then the rudder is at full-scale deflection for various airspeeds, we can see that the rudder is a function of airspeed, while engine forces remain constant because we're at maximum power regardless. So if we're at 120 knots, we can see we have a surplus of force from the rudder. We are able to overcome the asymmetrical thrust of the aircraft. As the aircraft decelerates to 80 knots, though, we start to have less and less rudder authority because there's less and less air traveling over the rudder. At 80 knots, the rudder forces equal the engine forces, and that is the minimum control speed. Below 80 knots, we're going to lose control of the aircraft because it will begin to yaw in the direction the forces of the engine are pulling, which is why you never want to skip leg day uh, because there's a lot of force that you'll be offsetting um, just by using the rudder. I mean, you're literally fighting against an entire engine trying to pull the aircraft around the center of gravity. This is a picture of myself in my Piper Aztec that I owned for a couple years uh, on one of the engine shutdowns we did during training. But the rudder isn't the only thing that can help control the aircraft as we begin to decelerate. Uh, the ailerons themselves can also, if used correctly, reduce the minimum control speed by adding uh, some lift in the horizontal direction. So as we're flying along, if we bank into the operating engine, so in our example here we have a right engine operative and a left engine failed. As the lift is produced, there will be a component of that lift that acts in the vertical direction. 
but there will also be a smaller component that acts in the horizontal direction and even though it's a small component it makes a big difference when we are talking about directional control and just by banking up to about five degrees you can significantly reduce VMC and control the aircraft at a much slower speed if necessary but what happens when we get to VMC so we've talked about the rudder we've talked about the ailerons but let's talk about if we inadvertently get so slow that we reach that VMC point well we started off with two symmetrical thrusts on each side of the engine then we went to an asymmetrical thrust with the other engine not producing any thrust then we're offsetting it with our rudder we're rolled into it but when we finally reach VMC the aircraft the rudder is no longer going to be able to control the forces from that engine and it is going to roll uh, or y'all, I'm sorry, into the inoperative engine. As it does that, we're already at a really slow speed. Uh, you know, in the Aztec, this was 80 knots, and stall speed was somewhere around mid-60s. So we are slow and getting close to a stall. So the result of that right wing kind of accelerating forwards and the left wing decelerating backwards, that rotational motion is going to give a lift imbalance across the wings. The left wing is not going to be producing as much wind uh, as much lift, I'm sorry, as the right wing, which is also going to cause the aircraft to roll. Now, this is the exact thing that happened in 2019 in Addison, Texas, when a King Air 300 rolled shortly after takeoff, and it was because the left engine failed on the King Air, uh, and the pilot did not put in the correct um, control surface. They actually put in left rudder correction which was opposite of what it should have been. He should have used right rudder with the left engine failed to control the aircraft and using that left rudder caused the aircraft to depart from runway heading and eventually it got to such a slow airspeed that it spun into the ground and it executed a VMC roll. Let's take a look at a video of the footage from the Addison Airport of that accident. As you can see, the accident was a horrendous uh, accident, did not take very long to happen, and the aircraft ends up rolling in about four seconds. That's all the time that it took to get into this VMC roll. So the summary in the NTSB report, which came out in May of 2021, reads in part that the evidence was that the pilot inadvertently responded to the failure of the left engine by putting left rudder in. It was known that the pilot had a habit of not using checklists, and if you look at the transcripts, there was no emergency briefing done prior to takeoff. So they do not know whether or not the aircraft manual was followed and the use of friction locks to keep the throttle from accidentally rolling back on the King Air 300, um, which it was prone to do. There was a known issue with that, and if you did not set the friction locks correctly, you would have a reduction in engine power on takeoff, which is obviously a bad thing. And it is possible that the only reason this aircraft crashed was because the engine rolled back and he did not recognize it fast enough, put in the wrong correction, and in less than 30 seconds, the aircraft was destroyed in the accident. So what should he have done? What would have been the proper correction? I've already kind of alluded to it. But there's two things that we can do once we reach VMC to recover from it. As soon as we get a loss of direction of control, we should have already been using the rudder to offset the thrust and hopefully banking into the operating engine. But there's two ways to come out of a VMC roll if you catch it quick enough. The f both of these should be done simultaneously and really uh, we're, there's no particular order I'm going to do them in. I'm just going to start with pitch and then we'll talk about power. So the first thing is pitch and the first thing you want to do if you start to lose control of the aircraft, it starts to yaw on you and even potentially starts to roll, you want to reduce back pressure to lower the nose regardless of what altitude you're at. Even if you're close to the ground you want to lower the nose and the reason is, is if you don't you will lose control of the aircraft and it will go inverted and you will crash. 
So by lowering the nose, what would the pilot be doing? They're going to try to accelerate the aircraft to give the rudder more authority. So by lowering the nose, we're really, if we look at this graph, we're moving from a lower airspeed, VMC speed, up higher to where we have a surplus of rudder authority uh, over the engine that is operating. The other thing you can do is you can actually go ahead and reduce the power on that engine as well. So lowering the nose moves the aircraft away from VMC by increasing its speed. And reducing power, as we can see in this example, if we go from 1,000 foot-pounds of force theoretically on the engine to 500, we significantly move VMC away from where the aircraft is operating. So by both reducing power and lowering the nose, you can recover from the loss of control if you do it quick enough uh, as you're approaching VMC. So that's all that we're going to discuss in this video. Hopefully in the next video we'll actually come back and discuss how the FAA uh, certifies VMC um, and makes it that one single line. We've already discussed the fact that even in the last slide we saw that there's ways that you can change VMC speed. So why is there a set single airspeed that is VMC? So make sure you subscribe and stick around so that way next time we can take a look at part 23 and the regulations surrounding certifying aircraft for minimums control speed. Thanks and have a great day. We'll see you next time.